Hello everyone and welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo where we find, learn, and play the great strategy games. Today we're going to be getting back into Gary Grigsby's War in the Pacific Admirals Edition. We're making a basic tutorial for this game. This will be episode number two. In this episode we're going to be looking over the map and all of the graphical representations that this game gives you on the map. In episode number one we looked over the main menu, we talked about all the different options and preferences of how to play this game. We also looked at the grand strategic map, which we will do again today, and we touched lightly on scenario selection. Now one thing I did want to mention about scenario selection is we've basically just talked about the full campaign. There are smaller scenarios, so the Battle of the Coral Sea, May 1st to May 15th, 1942. It's a 15-turn scenario, so if you don't want to bite the whole apple and you just want to play a smaller scenario where you can move around some ships and blow some things up and see how the game works, you can do that. Guadalcanal is like a seven or eight month, eight month scenario. Um, it's not quite the time commitment that the full campaign is. A second thing I wanted to mention is Quiet China. The Chinese ground war is big. It takes some time. Maybe some people don't want to play the ground war component of the Pacific War. Uh, they would rather, you know, move ships and planes around and kind of deal U.S. versus Japan as opposed to the Chinese War. You can do that with these Quiet China scenarios. In these, the Japanese AI will move to certain objective points within China, then they stop and the game basically becomes a stalemate there and you don't really have to worry about the ground war. So I just wanted to mention those two things. Um, we're going to play the December 8th full campaign, as I mentioned last time, so let's go ahead and start that up. Uh, Pearl Harbor happened yesterday. Our fleet, um, as the Americans, was decimated. Um, a lot of our aircraft were destroyed, of course. Uh, it just took a historical turn for December 7th, and now we're on to December 8th. As you see, we've got our hex outline here around Pearl Harbor. That's where you will always start as the allied player. After every turn, it always centers you back on Pearl Harbor. You see the radial lines coming out here. Uh, we'll talk about those when we talk about ships and planes. For now, they basically just mean this is how far certain things can move. You see these American flags. Now, is that just you know, people hung those out being patriotic after Pearl Harbor. Oh, she can you? No, those are bases. So the flags in this game are bases. And if we go over here to Australia, you'll see Australia has Australian flags. Um, if we go up here to India, you see the British flag. Dutch East Indies, you see the Dutch flags. Every one of these flags is a base. This entire game is built around bases. Bases are where everything, for the most part, happens. Can you do amphibious landings? Yes, you can, and we'll talk about those. But 98% of this game is structured around bases. And every one of those flags stands for one where certain things can happen. So as I said in this episode, I want to talk about the map. Now we're kind of coming out here over the Pacific. You see all of this blue a lot of ocean hexes. Um, this deep blue, and then you see the light blue, that's not, that doesn't just look pretty. That actually has some practical effects. A deep blue hex is a what they call an OD, an ocean deep. A light blue hex is an ocean shallow. So there are two main differences between the ocean hexes. The first is submarine warfare. A submarine is much more easily sp spotted in shallow water. So, you know, if you have your sub parked right here, it's quite likely, if you're the Japanese player, you have a Japanese sub here, it's quite likely that the Canadians can see you. So it affects sub warfare. The other thing it affects is our mines and mine laying and mine detection. So here in the light, it will be easier to detect mines. Also in the deep, uh, mines degrade faster. 
I don't know, you know, salt water, they're harder to maintain, etc. So just a couple of things to think about when it comes to the ocean hexes. Before we move a little higher here, you can see here's Canada. You can see all of the different kinds of terrain. There are 14 different kinds of terrain from clear, which is what this is. You got mountainous, swampy. Uh, we'll look at the key here in a minute. You also see these, you know, rope looking items. This is a major railway. So the black and white is a major railway. Um, the clear rope is a major road. The smaller black line is a minor road. And if we get up here, you can see this barbed wire is a minor railway. So there are basically four different kinds of transportation things that you see on the map. Major road, major railway, minor road, and then we just saw over here the minor railway. Now those affect how fast things move, of course. A major railway, you can put more on it. It's going to move a little faster than a minor railway. Uh, same with a major road and a minor road. This game is largely about logistics. These major railways are very, very important. Uh, other than moving things across the ocean, when you're moving things on land, moving them on a major railway is a must. Uh, so they will all pretty much lead to your big cities and big ports. But major railways are how you get things from the East Coast to the West Coast. Uh, let's go up here. As I've said before, I think this is maybe the greatest board game ever made. It just happens to be on a PC. Like all good board games, you've got a key. So this key lists the four dif or 14 different kinds of terrain that you'll see on the map. It talks about the bonuses that you get for each type of defending each type of terrain. So if you're sitting defending a swamp, take your defensive value and times it by three. As usual with all games of this type, clear is kind of the base. You know, it's the, it's the base that everything else is based off of. Um, supply cost, it costs more to supply, more difficult types of terrain. It's more difficult to move through more difficult types of terrain for all different kinds of units, whether it be artillery, anti-aircraft, infantry, paratroopers, armor, or other. Now you see this terrain short. What does that mean? Let's move down here to Canada. If you hit on the one button on your keypad, that's a shortcut to showing the terrain on every single hex on the map. So we've got WD, we move up, move to the right. Uh, WD stands for forest. I guess it means wooded, right? <laughs> I don't know, why didn't they make it FO? But uh, yeah, wooded is forest. You can also tell that with this map mod that we're using this deep dark green, that's gonna be forest or wooded if you prefer. The mountains look like mountains. You also have rivers running through the map. So you have what they call major and minor rivers. There's really no distinction between them. They may look different on the map, but from a playability perspective, they don't really have a practical effect. The one thing to keep in mind about rivers as you're starting off is that, is that if you are defending behind a river, so let's say you have ground units here, and someone wants to attack you over that, that, that attacker will suffer massive penalties moving across a river. It causes their forces to become disrupted and really stops a lot of attacks right in their tracks, uh, which makes sense, right? You know, you're moving across a river. It's like every other war game in the world. Moving across a river, you're going to get some penalties. So those are the major map features. Now let's talk about these flags again, which stand for bases. So there's Portland, right? Um, that flag stands for Portland. You don't really have to think about it as the town of Portland. It's, it's the base of Portland. Um, and this base has certain graphics around it. And for this, I'm going to actually move down to Australia. I think it's easier to show down here. And we're going to look at Sydney. So at Sydney, you'll see we've got the Australian flag, which means it's an Australian base. Every, there are over 800 bases in the game. Every one of those bases will be controlled 
by one country or another and whoever controls the base it will show their flag so here we obviously have an Australian flag at Sydney now you'll see it has four icons around it those same four icons are standard throughout the game you have what appears to be a ship what appears to be an airfield what appears to be a ground unit um, and then come on tooltip and what ha appears to be an anchor here maybe you can see that a little more clearly here at Port Kimbla so what appears to be an anchor so when you're cycling around the map you're like okay I've got a base here what am I seeing just kind of the grand overview well if you see this icon the NATO icon on a box that means you have at least one ground unit there that doesn't mean you only have one ground ground unit there you may have a hundred but seeing that icon means you have at least one ground unit at this base now ground units can also appear where there is no base and again it will be here at the up bottom left you see that you do have a ground unit in this hex at least one there may be more than one if you click on it it will bring it up yep there's just one here now let's click on the one at Sydney uh, there are all of these ground units here so NATO box you've got ground units anchor anchor means that you have ships at anchor at that port that are not in a task force so this is actually a very important icon when I look around the map to play if I see that anchor icon I will always click on that base and say why are those ships just sitting there at anchor why aren't they doing something oftentimes they will be uh, cargo ships and generally speaking you want your cargo ships moving supplies or fuel from bases that do that do have it to bases that do not so again generally speaking if you see this anchor you want to get in there you want to figure out what's going on with these ships why are they just sitting there in port and that's what that anchor symbol means so and again it will always be to the top left so we'll see that it's down here in Melbourne there's an anchor to the left let's click on that and let's see yep we've got a bunch of ships that are not in task forces just sitting here at Melbourne in anchor or at anchor excuse me <clears throat> in Port Kimbla it appears we have some ships you can click on the anchor on the map yep we've got three ships here that are not in task forces um, obviously you know here in Tamworth you're not going to have any ships at anchor it's not on the coast uh, that would take some doing to get it up here now here's one on the coast it does not have an anchor so there are no ships there at anchor now back down here to Sydney you'll see that we have this this what appears to be like a little airplane in the icon that means we have air wings at Sydney um, how many we don't know unless we click on it and it appears we have five air wings at Sydney so again this doesn't mean you only have one it means you have at least one so every time you see one of these icons around a base you know that you have certain things there the final thing in the bottom right and it will always appear to the bottom right you can see it does not appear here at Newcastle but it does appear here at Sydney when you see a ship an actual ship that means you have task forces here so you have ships that have been set up into a task force that presumably have orders although I will click on those if they're at a base because it could be that they're just sitting there at your port and not doing anything now they could be loading or unloading and it would still show up here but it's possible they're not doing anything this just shows you that you have task forces here so what uh, what happens if a task force moves away from port well let's find a task force and here's a good one you see this representation of a ship here now this does not mean that there is only one ship so you look at this and you're like well why is that ship out there sailing around all by itself this is the representation for a task force now see we open that up and you see we've got a task force here you're going to see all of its orders it's going to show you how far it can move where it's moving to 
uh, etc. If it has planes up in the air, you'll see, you know, their concentric circles. But let's just focus on this for a minute and go down to the heads up display. So we've got this one ship, right? Nope, we actually have the task force for the carrier Lexington. And that's listed here on top. We will get into task forces, what they're made up of, what all of this means. I just want to show you that that graphic, that icon does mean, not mean that there are there is only one ship. It means that there's a task force. Uh, generally, you'll it, if there are two task forces in a hex, it will show both task forces. Now we can come out here. There's a submarine. You can tell by the icon. Come down here. And submarines usually are lone wolves in this game. You can put multiple submarines in a task force, but usually they are a task force in an, in and of themselves. So as you can see, you can have task forces with just one ship, but you can have task forces with much m m many more ships than that. So. I just wanted to show you that about task forces. So let's go back down here to Australia and talk about this a little bit more. So let's go to Port Kimbla, where we have a ground unit, we have ships at anchor. This is a summary, obviously, <clears throat> very high level of what you've got at this base. You can also scroll over it here, put your pointer on it, and you'll see the tooltip. This tooltip, again, is a summary. It's not telling you everything about the base, but it gives you a little bit more information than just the icons. So here you see Port Kimbla is a base. You see its location, 9168. You, just, you see a detection level, and we will get into detection levels in a future episode. Essentially, detection levels run from 1 to 10. The number on the left is the actual detection detection level that the Japanese have on this base at this moment. The number on the right is the maximum that they can have or have had in the past, um, but we'll talk more about that later. There's heavy cloud cover over Port Kimbla. Um, every base has victory point values, and you see this here. Value to Japan, 90-10. Value to the Allies, 9-1. Now, we will talk more about that when we talk about victory conditions and the victory, uh, the Im information button at the top uh, of the screen here. We're not going to do that now. You see air capacity, manpower, resource, etc. Now, we're not going to go through all of those because we're going to do bases next time and talk about what all those mean. But graphics-wise, I just wanted you to see you can go over a base and see quite a bit of information about it. Further, if you go down here to the heads-up display, you get a even better summary. So we're continuing to drill down here. You go from what you can see just on the map to the tooltip to the heads up display of the hex that you have highlighted. So we see we're looking at Port Kimbla. Now again, so this is a summary. It's not going to tell you everything. I'll show you that in just a moment. But this gives you a summary of what's here. How is it laid out? Always the same way. It tells you the size of the port at that base. It tells you the size of the airfield at that base. Now, it's important to note here, you can only have ports and you can only have airfields where there is a base. So you can't have an airfield here. You obviously couldn't have a port here, but you, you <laughs> can also not have a port here, even though it's on a coastal hex. You can only have ports and airfields at bases. It shows you the supply level, the fuel level, the number of ships in port, which we just saw that, right, uh, with the anchor. Uh, the number of aircraft here, and we knew that. We knew that there were no aircraft. We knew that there were ships in port. We knew that there were ground units, which you will see here. So as we get below here, what you will see is always listed the same way. On the top, and we'll go to Sydney to show this, on the top are the air wings that are at this base, or more appropriately said, they're at the airfield at this base. Below that, you'll see the task forces that are at this base, and we knew we had a task force here because of the ship, and sure enough, we've got a task force. 
you will see the ground units. We knew we had ground units. Here are all the ground units. And then finally, we've got production. And production is a whole different topic. Um, production mainly happens in the larger cities. And it's how you get supplies. It's how you get new ships and new planes. And again, we'll talk about that later. We're just talking about the map and graphics now. So you see this the same way every time. If we go to Port Kimbla, we know no air wings, no task forces, but we knew that already. No air wings, no task forces. We do have ground units and we do have some production facilities here. That's not represented on the map. You kind of have to click on the base to see if it has any production facilities. So over here to the left, you'll see it's always listed the same way. You see the name of the base. Um, let's go to Sydney to show this better. You see the name of the base. You can cycle amongst the air wings that are at your airfields at the base. You can cycle if there was more than one through the task forces. And you can cycle with these arrow buttons through the ground forces. You can also just click on them and it will give you all the information about that ground unit. To the left, here's another place where you can see a lot of this information. So the anchor means ships at port. Makes sense. The anchor on the map means that. But you can also access this, this here um, on the heads up display screen. So these are all the ships at port. We hit on the anchor. If you hit on this anchor here, it's the exact same thing. It's all the ships at port. Uh, air wings. You can see those again. You can see them here. You can see them if you click here. So this information appears in a lot of different places. Um, you know, again, task forces, production, we will get into all of that. Now, if you click on one of these tiles, uh, you know, if you want to, whatever you want to call it from your board game days, um, a counter, I guess you would say, this brings up what I kind of call the baseball card for what you're dealing with. So you will see FP, which eventually we'll know means float plane. You'll click on that, and this is an air wing. This is its baseball card, per se. This tells you all of the stats and every order, everything you're going to have this air wing do. So this is not just one plane, even though that's the, the icon. This is actually four planes in this air wing. And these four planes will always kind of be together. They're in an air wing. You will give it orders here. You'll tell it, you know, patrol levels, altitude, range. You'll tell it to do a naval search, let's say. Maybe you want it to do some training. That all happens on the counter for each air wing, each task force, each ground unit. Uh, each production facility. There are things you can do with the production facilities. So let's bring up a ground unit. This ground unit is the 39th Australian Battalion. It's an infantry unit. It will be in dark green because all Australian units are in dark green. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. is in a more olive green. The British forces are kind of a brown. Dutch forces are gray. And you'll see that as we cycle around the map and do more things. But this gives all the stats, what's in this unit, infantry section, a vicar's section, support, etc. You can give uh, all the orders here, combat, move, strategic move, rest. Again, we'll get into all of this um, in the ground units episode. But I just wanted you to see that this is basically the baseball card for each and every counter on the map. So let's go up here to India because I want to talk about one other feature of the map and that is off-map locations. Now we call them off-map uh, or off-map bases. We call them off-map because they have different rules around them. Of course they're actually on the map as you can see here at Abaddon, or if we go over here, Eastern US, 
you can see them on the map, but they're considered off-map locations when they have this box next to them. Now, there are special rules about these. You can see Canada and the United Kingdom. Now, these bases, so for the United Kingdom and for quote-unquote Canada, these bases represent, in the United Kingdom's case, the entire country. So it's kind of an amalgamation of all the different ports and all the supply and everything that would come out of the United Kingdom. And rather than make this map four times larger, they've just put it over here in what we call an off-map base. Um, in Canada, this represents, you know, Quebec and Montreal and all of those places that are not on this map since we just see Western Canada. Um, also, the eastern U.S., this would be New York and Boston and Norfolk and all of those big eastern ports that ship things through the Panama Canal to the Pacific Theater and, as you can see, ship things down rail lines to the west coast. So this is the Transcontinental Railroad. You follow it, it pops out here at Salt Lake City, and the next thing you know, it's down in San Francisco. So you can ship things by rail, and you will quite often um, ship things by rail from the East Coast to the West Coast. Now the special rules around these are, I call these a, a penalty box, uh, for lack of a better term. So here you've got a port. Um, there will be ships that uh, get commissioned here at the Eastern US. You'll put them into task forces, and you'll want to sail them to the Panama Canal through it and over to the Pacific. So as that task force moves out and starts to sail, it'll come here and it'll sit here for a prescribed number of days that kind of correspond with how long it would take to get down here to the Panama Canal. So, you know, a little bit of a fiction. It moves through this little pipe all the way down to the Panama Canal. I think it also sits here for a few days and then it will move into Crystal Ball, the base that's on uh, the eastern side of the Panama Canal. Then it will move into Balboa, uh, which sits on the western side of the Panama Canal. Now, once it gets through here, you'll give it a new order once it gets here. We'll talk about that. But once it gets through here, it will then go sit at this penalty box for a few days and then move into the Pacific. So you can send something from the east coast of the United States down through the Panama Canal, up, and then eventually have it come to Pearl Harbor. Uh, same idea up here. You can send something from Abaddon. Um, just because of the map mod I'm running, this base appears over here for some reason. In the stock version of the game, it's right here. But in Abaddon, if you have big oil tankers, there's a lot of oil that comes out of Abaddon. If you have a big oil tanker, it will come and sit here, sit here in each penalty box for this prescribed number of days, and then eventually emerge here and come down to, let's say, Karachi, where it will unload all of that oil for the uh, Indian economy to use and turn into supplies and fuel. So that's how these off-map locations work. They're very important, actually. I, I think in some board games, they're not very important or computer games that are not very important. But for instance, Cape Town is massively important. Almost all of your British supplies are gonna come to Cape Town and then from Cape Town to Perth. As a matter of fact, if we click on Cape Town, I think you already have a task force set up to go to Perth, and you do. You can see this is gonna come, oh, no, I was wrong. This is gonna go to Singapore. Uh, but you get the idea, things come from off map onto the map, kind of lined up with where they need to be to get where they want, and that will determine how long they sit in the penalty box. So we've covered quite a bit about the map today. We've talked about different kinds of terrain, the different graphical representations of railroads and roads and how those work a little bit. Uh, we've talked about the icons that surround a base and what those mean, the heads up display, and also what I call the back of the baseball card for every base and unit. So this will wrap up number two. I think this is a good place to stop. Next time in episode three, I think we'll start going through the buttons here at the top. I call those the info buttons. You can learn a lot about what you have 
uh, what forces you have, what ships you have. Uh, it, it's just a ton of information that you will see in those buttons, and I think we'll get into those next time. So thank you very much for joining me for episode two of this basic tutorial for War in the Pacific Admirals edition. I'll see you next time.